Okay. Yeah, like back that way. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to those of you still filtering in. There are lots of seats uh, down in front, a couple of rows here and over to the side. I'm very, very pleased to have you with us uh, tonight. I'm Steve Call, the Dean of the Journalism School. I'd like to welcome uh, our guests from other parts of the university and the law school. And I just wanted to do uh, two quick things. One is to explain a little bit about what uh, this event marks for the Journalism School and then to introduce uh, President Bollinger, who's been very kind uh, to come over and, and uh, be with us this evening. So uh, the Saul and Janice Polyak Center for the Study of First Amendment Issues has been around the Journalism School since the early 80s. Uh, Saul Polyak was a graduate of the class of 1926 of the J School. Uh, and he left a very generous endowment for this center in the early 1980s, and then uh, it was toward the end of his years, and he and his wife Janice uh, passed, and so far as we know, they, have, they did not have uh, children or other heirs who have taken um, you know, an active uh, engagement with his legacy here. So over the years, the center has been interpreted in different ways, and, and it's, it's created enormous value for the journalism school. It's brought visiting professors to the school. It's, funded uh, studies of uh, press freedom issues and free expression issues. But in uh, recent years, it hasn't had a leader, and it hasn't uh, been at the very center of the school's agenda. And that's what tonight is about, is, is, is addressing uh, those two opportunities. Uh, this is a time when not just US First Amendment law, but global free expression is very heavily contested. It's at the heart of journalistic practice, the questions of of uh, who is a journalist um, and how they can find the space to do serious public-minded work. Uh, and we wanted to have a forum uh, to, bring, to bring forward these questions very deliberately at the school. And then we also wanted uh, to think freshly about all of these uh, ideas with a new leader uh, and just so fortunate to have uh, succeeded in persuading Tim Wu to join us in that respect. I mean, Tim is one of the most creative conceptual thinkers in um, American uh, law today, but also particularly around the First Amendment. He coined the phrase net neutrality uh, famously, but his, it barely describes how wide-ranging his thinking is. And just to give you a taste of it, the second event that we intend to do in the spring uh, in the new Polyak Center is, is going to be about the neuroscience of uh, freedom. Essentially, is it possible to have free thought, uh, or how do we think about that in reference to what we're learning about our brains? So that's the kind of engagement and the range that we're hoping uh, to draw you into, and very grateful to have him here tonight. And as I say, also very grateful to have President Bollinger with us. Uh, really, for those of you who are at the journalism school for the first time this year, please understand we have the most uh, supportive president of a major university that any journalism s a school could hope for, and a powerful First Amendment scholar in his own right. He's written, I think, four uh, books about the First Amendment and press freedom issues. He's uh, uh, created important Supreme Court jurisprudence about diversity and affirmative action in this country. His most recent book is called Uninhibited, Robust, and Wide Open, A Free Press for a New Century. Uh, and he has just been a great friend of the school when Nick was dean. And since I've been here, I we're really very fortunate to have him. So please give him a very hearty welcome, uh, President Bollinger. So it's very, uh, very kind of you to have me over here. And, and uh, I always love coming to the journalism school. There's no, uh, no place I love more. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Law school's right up there. Um, so uh, let me just say a few things to uh, introduce this event. First of all, Steve is, we just couldn't have a better dean than uh, Steve following Nick, and uh, I'm just incredibly uh, grateful to him for taking this on. D the idea of coming up with the First Amendment sort of theme within the journalism school that would have this Polyak center uh, as its base, and it's just a tremendous idea. Uh, so. Uh, all for it. Uh, uh, Tim Wu is, is somebody whom uh, I admire especially uh, because 
Uh, he is prepared to think about things in an entirely new way. Uh, he's prepared to think about things that uh, combine things that aren't put together. I mean, it's unbelievable that people would be doing First Amendment um, law for now, I would say, basically a half century. I mean, it's a relatively new sort of subject. Uh, and yet, you would not find in, I think, most any First Amendment casebook uh, the discussion of copyright. Uh, and it's sort of amazing that uh, this area that has very significant limits on free speech uh, and free press uh, should not be part of the corpus of First Amendment. Tim is somebody who will just take that up. Another thing is the internet. It's incredibly, uh, I mean, one of the things I learned early on in my law career was that new and First Amendment career, New technologies of communi communication are not easily absorbed into First Amendment thought. And um, uh, so Tim is, is really, really gifted in this area, knowing so much about it, but also brave uh, in taking on uh, what this new area that seems obscure and, and, and seems not quite to fit, uh, how to, to work on it. So that's the main thing I can say. You've got somebody here now who is highly respected in the legal community, uh, highly respected in the technology community, but uh, you should know is incredibly adventuresome uh, in the ways that he's thinking about things. The last thing I, I would say is that uh, Tim's gonna talk about, um, uh, as I understand it, political corruption and uh, the First Amendment, what to do about it. I'm sure that Citizens United and these other cases will be a part of what uh, he's going to talk about. Here's a little bit of context. Within the traditions of the First Amendment over the past 100 years, and we're approaching the 100th year anniversary of the very first Supreme Court case uh, on freedom of speech and press in 1919, there have been two traditions to oversimplify. Uh, and one tradition says that uh, we're in favor of a marketplace of ideas, we're in favor of the search for truth. We're in favor of self-government. And in order to really achieve that, you have to recognize that the marketplace of ideas and self-government exist on a, in a context of other systems like the economic system, which favor some people over other people. And when it comes time to allowing an open marketplace of ideas, maybe we should allow the government to do something to try to minimize the advantages that people have uh, because of their economic success, which has very little to do, in fact, with their ideas, the quality of their ideas. And there are a number of cases that, that support that tradition, not least of which in the broadcasting uh, arena, where we had for many decades a fairness doctrine and an equal time provision and so on, which were designed in part to try to equalize opportunities for citizens who did not have the wealth that others have. And the other view uh, is that the last thing we ever want under the First Amendment, the most dangerous thing, is to allow the government to get involved in uh, manipulating uh, the scene in which uh, people express themselves. And those two views have contended against uh, one another. And uh, to some of us, and I count myself in that group, it's been unfortunate that the second view, I think, has uh, achieved a kind of uh, dominance uh, in the current jurisprudence. So it's that context that it's a great, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Wu to give his opening lecture at the Polyak Center. Tim. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's not going to be the uh, uh, longest lecture. I think we're going to maybe talk about uh, 20 minutes, and then Steve, that's why we have these chairs set up here so we can uh, talk. So um, I'll just give you a sense of how long it's going to be. Uh, as Lee guest, I'm going to try to plow some new ground in this talk, and so I'm trying to uh, try on uh, some fresh material. Um, and, you know, like, after a while, even as an academic, you become like a rock and roll band, and you're like, well, maybe I could just play the net neutrality thing or play something else. But every once in a while, you've got to try out a new material, and that's what, what I'm doing today. And I'm trying to depart slightly from the... Uh, simple conversation or the simple uh, dichotomy that uh, uh, Lee was talking about and try to focus on what I think is the somewhat neglected relationship between public virtue 
in our leaders and the First Amendment. So let me begin by discussing what I see as the problem and then discuss what I think the First Amendment might have to do with it. So uh, think back to uh, high school or college, or if you're in college, think about now. And you probably uh, know some people, maybe yourself, you're one of these people, who are sort of public-minded, seem like they want to change the world, have uh, you, you know, what you would describe as very public, spirited ambitions, have a certain integrity. Well, if you're a person from my generation, you will have known many of these people, and one of the things you've probably noticed, at least in my experience, is that very few such people go into politics nowadays. I would say in my generation, particularly electoral politics, in my generation, I feel that most of the most publicly spirited people I know, uh, uh, people I would say uh, who are people of virtue, uh, either went into journalism or they went into the tech industry. A lot of people thought they could do more in the tech industry or maybe into finance, or maybe into nonprofits. But politics, which is a place where it is supposed to be so important that we have the best, the brightest, the most brilliant, the most virtuous citizens involved, has, in my opinion, become a sector of our country which does not attract the best and brightest anymore, and often instead attracts people with the worst forms of motives. And I'll say this uh, in the context of being a few weeks away from an election in New York, where we have, for example, a congressman from St Staten Island, Michael Grimm, who is running, is probably going to win, and will immediately go to a criminal trial where he's facing 20, indi uh, 20 count indictments on the federal government for tax evasion, fraud, and embezzlement. Or another uh, uh, state senator, John Sampson, who is, uh, also uh, has a decent chance of winning, who is uh, also under indictment for stealing $400,000 uh, through various uh, uh, schemes uh, that he participated in. Now, these are just a couple examples. There's been 18 indictments of, uh, of public officials over the last, uh, sorry, 11 indictments of uh, public officials in New York, where we are over the last 18 years. And it adds to an atmosphere or a sense that politics in this state, but also often in this country, is somewhat uh, distasteful, something that it's uh, not a, a attractive to most, uh, to most people. In other words, um, uh, uh, something that you have to have rather unusual and often a bad character to get involved in. I think this is a very serious problem. Um, our form of government, a uh, Republican form of government, uh, demands by its nature, in opposition to other kinds of government, it demands that you have particularly talented people in leadership positions. It demands what the, the, was referred to uh, by the Romans as a public virtue or a civic virtue. And I mean by this a different sense than the Christian sense of virtue, which is avoidance of, of the usual forms of sins but rather a demand for, the, for attributes like public-mindedness, um, courage, uh, self-restraint in the use of power, and maybe most important, a sense that ultimately you dedicate your life to elevating the public over the private. Um, now, you may be wondering, okay, if I agree with this, how at all does this uh, connect to the First Amendment? Well, well, I think when we think broadly about the First Amendment, you'll see that it, it sets the environment in which politics uh, takes place and has almost everything to do with this issue. On the one hand, it is, uh, uh, the First Amendment is, by its nature, by the freedom it allows, a major force in allowing the inculcation of virtue, in creating a free society where people develop themselves, become uh, the kind of people we would like. Uh, to, 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 to lead or take important positions. But on the other hand, and uh, as Lee, Lee said, I would, talk, would mention this, I think it has done too much to license a system that proves corrupting, even of the best of those who enter into government. So a few hundred years ago, when the United States decided it would become a Republican uh, form of government, uh, it was pretty clear right, at the very, right from the very beginning, uh, John Adams, George Washington, Madison, some of the rest, uh, recognized that in order for the republic to succeed, it would be very important that it 
depend on a level of virtue in its leaders and among its citizens. Uh, John Adams wrote famously that the only foundation of a republic is public, of a republic is public virtue. There must be a positive passion for the public good, the public interest. And as I said, this was the Roman sense. They were uh, admirers of, of, of the Roman, uh, early Roman form of government uh, that thought that citizens and uh, leaders uh, need to embody ideals of courage, ideals of honesty, and uh, self-restraint and putting public uh, before private. There's a very, uh, I think, powerful intuition behind these ideas, the one that I hope you'll agree with. It's one thing to come up with structures that are designed to create good government, uh, control people, prevent bad things from happening. But even if you come up with really good structures, mechanisms, procedures, ultimately bad, dishonest people will find a way around them. Ultimately, the external checks and balances in life are not as powerful, at people like Adams thought, as the internal. I think this actually is a fault sometimes progressives and liberals uh, have when they, they, they in, in government, is there's sometimes too much faith that if you design the exact right institution, you can just wind it up and it'll operate perfectly. I don't think that's ever true. I think that if you've had any experience working anywhere, ultimately it comes down to the quality of the people and their capacity for virtue. And often when I've worked in government, for example, whether good or, or some, whether the leadership is good really makes a huge difference. We, you know, this doesn't seem controversial in the, in the private sector by any means where we have less faith in, in process and, and checks and balances. But in government, uh, I think it is equally important and sometimes uh, neglected. Now, of course, over its history, the United States has had a, a, a fair share, more than its fair share of uh, courageous, outstanding leaders. It's also true that because we have a more limited form of government, that many of the, it's, it's often a good thing when many of the most talented leaders in our history have gone into private industry or into journalism, into law, other uh, areas, and not all concentrated. It's, uh, some countries have the problem where all the talent is only in government, uh, but we have the opposite uh, problem. I've already mentioned some of, of, of uh, the examples uh, in our own state where we have um, just horrendous um, levels of corruption. Um, and I've given examples of venal corruption where people are you know, taking bags of money, just really robbing the public. But we have a more general problem where we've created an environment that I would say, even for good people who go into politics or government, tends to erode it. And I want to describe four ways in which, four or five ways in which this uh, happens. Um, when you enter uh, politics, I have a little experience with this myself. Um, one of the things that uh, quickly becomes apparent that everyone tells you is that there is nothing more important than raising money. And in particular, that donors' interests uh, must be held in the front of your mind at all time. In fact, it's kind of a, like a mental rewiring where I think a talented po politician, or after a while, the, the idea of constituent, particularly of, of which donors will uh, uh, be affected by which kind of statement, um, at least is there, whether it's obeyed or not. Now, part of what this has an effect, I think, is a corrosion of some of what I've described as, as the Roman uh, virtues. So for one example, uh, the virtue of honesty is, uh, or truth, uh, telling uh, can be lost uh, relatively uh, quickly. You'll notice sometimes that um, uh, politicians on the progressive side will, uh, or, or some of them, not all, will talk uh, very movingly and uh, despairing about the problem of inequality. But there is then a missing step where you would blame some of the actors who've created the inequality. And the reason that step is missing, for example, blaming Wall Street, uh, is that, of course, there is a real danger of destroying your donor base if you speak the truth of that uh, power. And so you, I think, become conditioned and uh, it, it actually erodes the courage that uh, is supposed to happen. It is a fear of saying something that could be offensive. Another thing that was classically important for the inculcation of sort of the virtuous uh, life is having a lot of time. One of the constraints that politicians face today is they spend enormous amounts of time on fundraising. Uh, a recent uh, PowerPoint for incoming Congress people recommended that they spend four hours or more on the telephone raising funds every day, and that is at a minimum. 
and that doing things like going to hearings is considered uh, in bad form or a waste of time. Um, if you spend all of your time, whether, first of all, it further um, uh, uh, warps the, the, the one towards uh, thinking only of what donors care about, um, but second, it just doesn't leave the kind of time or space that people would need to sort of think in a big way about uh, important issues. And so I think that the, uh, the dominance of fundraising, the dominance of donors in uh, the life of the politician has really uh, created a, 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 an erosion of that fundamental question of whether the public is elevated over the private. Because once you obey only who has funded you, you have in that moment betrayed the broader public for a more narrow set of interests. And that is corruptive of the basic idea of, uh, uh, of virtue. So what can we say um, about this and the First Amendment? I, I'm not, I think there's many ways in which the First Amendment is implicated in this question of civic virtue, not all of which uh, uh, are always thought about. So one of the most important, and uh, Louis Brandeis is responsible for this thinking, I'd say, in, in the Whitney, the famous uh, Whitney concurrence that he wrote, is that the First Amendment is essential, the sort of the cornerstone on the idea of creating a nation of free thinkers, men and women who can be developed to, uh, can be free to develop their own interests and can, in fact, develop themselves as citizens, become true citizens of the republic without fear that they will be punished for their views. And that, I think, is one of the reasons this First Amendment tradition is why America has created so many uh, wonderful and interesting leaders who, in one way or another, have felt they can think differently. This is a free country, and the First Amendment uh, bears a lot of responsibility for it. And I'll quote Brandeis, because he writes so well. Um, he said, the founders recognized that it is hazardous to discourage thought, hope, and imagination, that fear be breeds repression, that repression breeds hate, that hate menaces stable government, that the path of safety lies in the opportunity to discuss freely supposed grievances and propose remedies, and that the fitting remedy for evil counsels is good ones. And so as I've said, the First Amendment tradition has an incredibly important role in maintaining and uh, giving life to a free society, which is the kind of place that cultivates the leaders we want to see, not only in government, but uh, across uh, all of the parts of the country. Um, on the other hand, it is the same First Amendment, however, interpreted differently, that since the 1970s, I would suggest is not the only cause, but certainly an accomplice in the evolution of a political system, which even for the best men and women can make uh, the government experience begin to warp their values and make, as I've suggested, donor interests and um, the continual pursuit of money and the continual pursuit of financial support the major part of that experience. Um, I've said some of the reasons already, whether it's the sheer time spent, whether it is the continual need to adjust policies to avoid offending uh, moneyed constituents. Uh, there is a whole host of ways in which even the best, most virtuous person, you know, the John Adams of our time, were they in Congress today, I think, would emerge a diminished figure. And that's taking, at the, that's taking it at its best. What uh, sometimes is worse is that also because, this is not the First Amendment's fault, but because government is not lucrative, is so poorly paid compared to other positions that from the outset, it has begun to attract a kind of person whose idea is not on the job itself, but on the job they have after being in government, where you will be a consultant or a lobbyist in a very lucrative way. So already you have people who are seeing government as a means, not an end, and they're therefore attracted for the wrong reasons. Now this is a, uh, I've suggested some of the problems and tried to put public virtue uh, back into discussion. <laughs> it's a lot easier to suggest uh, the problems than to suggest the solutions, and they've been with us for a very long time. But I think it is important to, and indeed essential, to re-examine and understand our First Amendment tradition with an eye towards seeing what effect the campaign finance system has on the internal character of our leaders, 
on the kind of people we expect will be attracted to government and ultimately the kind of leadership this nation will have. Whether we are to be as great as we were envisioned to be or whether we are to be diminished, I think, is in some ways on the back not only of uh, our uh, political system but also how we understand the First Amendment. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, we're going to talk for 15 minutes or so, and then we'll invite you to the microphone. When you come up, just be reminded we're live streaming this, so you're, you're on the record and uh, act accordingly. So, um, uh, so, so Tim, uh, a couple of things I wanted to ask about. First sure. of all, let's talk about your, your campaign. You were sure. uh, a candidate for the Republican um, Nomination. Actually, the Democratic nomination. But I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I talked so much about Republican virtue yes, that it got, uh, it got into my yeah, brain. Yeah. Um, that's fine. Uh, and you won 41 percent of the vote. Um, you were outspent probably by what ratio? Um, if you count, depends on whether you count Zephyr, but maybe 100 to 1. 100 to 1. Yeah. And so when you were out uh, on the trail and uh, you could feel that at least you were, you were reaching a significant number of voters, it turned out to be quite a significant minority of Democratic primary voters. What was it that you were saying that they were responding to? That's a great question. Um, I think part of it was a sense of dissatisfaction with the state of corruption, a sense of, of uh, New York politics in particular having reached levels of corruption. I mean, everyone expects a little bit of corruption in government. I don't, I mean, that may sound ridiculous, you expect a little bit, but the level of people being in, in, in prison, there was a lot of disappointment um, with the fact that the, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, who had been elected to be a um, anti-corruption fighter, had uh, seemed to betray that when he, when he shut down the, the, the commission, the Moreland Commission. And, uh, and uh, sorry, it went, sorry bit, let me, yeah, I didn't say that yeah. uh, right. But the, the governor had uh, campaigned as anti-corruption crusader. He set up a commission which was supposed to investigate uh, corruption. When the commission began to investigate the governor's uh, allies and donors, he first tried, or his staff tried to prevent them being subpoenaed, and then eventually just shut it down abruptly. And I think a lot of people sort of said, well, you know, is that really what we were looking for uh, in an anti-corruption uh, governor? Um, and then I think some of the outcomes, the things that people responded to were situations where it seemed the public interest pointed very much in one direction but that there wasn't a lot of political uh, will in trying to exer uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, the Comcast merger, um, I haven't heard anyone, a member of the public, who says I'm really excited about Comcast taking over our cable system. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone ever say there's anything good about it for a consumer. I've heard Comcast say it, but uh, you know, even the most rough economic calculus, Time Warner costs $105 a month usually. That's what they get out, their average customer. Comcast somehow manages to get $155 out of the average customer. Maybe they get more. I haven't heard Comcast customers saying they're more satisfied. Um, and so there's this huge possibility of New Yorkers paying a, you know, more than a billion dollars collectively more for cable service. No one seemed very excited about it. And so they seemed upset that you know, someone's not doing something about this. It just seemed that Comcast has it in their pocket because they'll be able to spread enough donations around. So they reacted to that. Another thing is the issue of fracking. I, I don't know what percentage of New Yorkers uh, really uh, think uh, it should be stopped, but certainly a lot of our supporters wanted to stop fracking. So those are some of the issues where they, I, I, and I, the, the tenor was, like I said, where they felt private interests were being elevated over the public. And I think it's a, sorry, this question, this answer's been long, but I think there's a lot of Americans, or at least uh, the ones we wrote, who believe that the inequality in our society has reached a level where it's no longer sort of something you talk about, has become a moral issue where they feel it's begun to betray the vision of what America was supposed to be all about, where we all, everyone arrived here and was roughly equal trying to, uh, but that there's such differences between the wealthy and the middle class that it, it has in, become very difficult to think of us as a society, and I think that really resonated. Hmm. So uh, when people talk about political corruption in the First Amendment these days, and mm -hmm. as promised, you stepped out of the kind of conventional engagement with that uh, subject, but let's take it on here a little bit, because sure. at least as, as a non-lawyer, what I understand uh, the state of affairs to be is that the recent uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence in Citizens United and McCutcheon and cases going back, in addition to finding that 
corporations or people in campaign spending as speech, has defined corruption, that corruption to be avoided um, so narrowly as it basically to define it as bribery and, and not much right. else, not much, right. you know, not buying access, not buying influence, contextual influence and so forth. So I guess there's a sort of an effort underway to try to think about how do you get back to a place, even if it's a generation from now, right. where, where a new court redefines corruption in a way that is consistent with what the American people think, presumably your right. voters. Right. So is some of the framing that you offered yes. an idea for, for strategic litigation, as they say? Or is yeah, well, it's an idea for, I think, part of a chorus of voices who say we need to understand the concept of corruption much more broadly than simply the exchange of money for favors, which is the sort of uh, 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 kind of corruption uh, imagined to be worth uh, uh, the quid pro quo kind of corruption uh, mentioned in the Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence. And I think we are, what I was trying to suggest in my talk is that there are important uh, public interests, compelling government interests, in trying to um, create an environment that does not corrupt the character of our leaders, if that makes sense. And I guess time is a great example. I mean, it seems amazing to me that you will have our elected leaders spending four, maybe five, six hours a day, that's a power of five, on the telephone, you know, raising money. First of all, it discourages a lot of people from wanting to do the job. You know, it discourages a lot of people from wanting to do the job. So they're like, I actually went to college, so I'm not interested in doing, uh, you know, uh, telemarketing for the rest of my life. I mean, that's, some people will be like, the, the thing about being an elected government, you have to be crazy because you have to be on the phone for five hours a day raising money, and that's just an enormous burden. But second, if you just think of the time that is taking away from people. So I think when we get to this question of corruption or corrupting the political system, we need to focus more on the effects on the individuals, on what that position will be like and how will they'll be making their decision. So the time is one uh, aspect. The con as I said, the kind of mental or psychological reliance or avoidance of offending uh, donors or, or uh, potential uh, constituents is another area. And I, I think that we need to sort of understand the state that the, le that the legislator or the elected official ends up in <coughs> as a result of la um, our campaign finance situation. Sorry, that's no. some water. And, and so uh, in in your experience on the campaign trail, I mean, mm -hmm. you had a slightly unusual experience because you didn't have to dial for dollars mm -hmm. uh, for months and months before you ran, and, and you ran a campaign that, that uh, you know, was underfunded given mm -hmm. um, the norm. But what did you actually find on the road when you went to meetings like this to give a talk or when you when you did uh, interact with donors or just mm -hmm. in the kind of texture of actually running for office, did it feel like a healthy 18th century kind of uh, experience <laughs> or did it feel um, unhealthy in some way? One thing I'll say about uh, what America is, at least my experience from, from running, is like a lot of things, I think that maybe a generation ago there were a few things that everyone paid some attention to. So let's say, this is a media example, everyone would watch, say, Walter Cronkite, CBS. Um, and, you know, general aspect of society is things are much, and everyone maybe would listen to Elvis or the Beatles or so forth. The future of our society today is very fragmented. People have very fragmented interests. And if they are interested in it, they're obsessed. So if you have a television show, you've watched every single episode. Or if you like political news, you watch Fox or MSNBC every day and you know everybody. If, but if you don't pay any attention, then you know nothing. So what I found on the campaign trail is we would either uh, meet voters, uh, if we met voters who showed up at our, they had a level of education, you know, they were, they were political geeks. They were completely obsessed, they knew everything that was going on. Uh, and then if you run into people who were just like one step beyond that, they knew absolutely nothing. Oh, there's a primary or, you know, who's the governor? I mean, they know who the governor is, but, you know, know nothing. And so I think we've ended up in a, in a situation in the United States where uh, it's actually a very tiny number of people uh, who pay active attention to things like primary politics, state politics, and then have a disproportionate power. It's almost like we've gone back to the English aristocracy where you only have a, a limited number of voters, except for the voters aren't defined by class, they're defined by obsession and interest. 
I mean, if you get really interested in primaries and start to vote and organize in primaries, you could have a very large effect on American politics right now. You know, Cru uh, Senator Cruz, from Ted Cruz from Texas, was elected, I think, by 2.1% of the Texas population. So, and you know, he's had this enormous effect on, he shut down the government a couple times, but all because some tiny percentage of Texas voters who actually went to Republican primary to, to this, uh, you know, got, got him elected. So especially as things move more to primaries, I think our country is run by a very small number of people who are obsessed with politics. The, not run by, elected by those people. I mean, if you, if you credit public opinion polling, there is an enormous gap between what the public believes is corrupting about mm -hmm. money and politics and what the Supreme Court has ruled about yeah. that. And so it's a, and for once, uh, you know, journalists are aligned with public opinion and that journalists have always been interested in forms of public corruption beyond bribery and you know, right. access and influence and so forth and probably will persist in that. But um, when, you, when you went out and talked about uh, corruption, apart from the examples of you know, people going to jail for taking bags of money, mm -hmm. did you find that there was a sense because that people wanted uh, a protest movement to arise around this issue? Because it's, it's, it sort of feels like, it, in New York anyway, it, mm -hmm. the tide has come up, but just below the wall. So we just yes. barely did not get the public financing. And right. we just barely right. have, you know, tipped back every time it seems as if we were going to create a model for the rest of the country. Yeah, well, this is a, this is a, a challenge, and one I think journalists will recognize is that it's very hard to get people interested in sort of more abstract forms of corruption, like a sense, even maybe some of the ones I was talking about, just sort of a sense that people are feeling the weight of donor interest, and much more much easier to have uh, excitement about something like blocking a couple lanes of the George Washington Bridge, which may actually do a lot less economic damage than, say, for example, uh, the Comcast merger, but is much um, vi more visceral. Mm -hmm. Or these venal corruption cases where you have, as you know, some of them are really, I mean, I don't, they're, they're interesting. Um, John, uh, who was talking, the, um, the, the Brooklyn, Center, he actually threatened witnesses. <laughs> you know, he was like, he called the, uh, I want to get his name right so I don't name the wrong guy. Uh, John Sampson, he actually called and, and uh, threatened, uh, uh, contacted the, East, the, the, the um, U.S. attorney and said, give me his friend, and said, give me the witness list so I can take care of the witnesses here. You know, so that kind of stuff is sort according of... According to the indictment, as we say in journalism. Yeah, according to the indictment. Um, <laughs> well, according to, on, on information and belief, as we say <laughs> <Yes>. in law. <laughs> and so, um, uh, when it gets visceral, there's, there's a lot more interest. But I do think, at least, uh, we can't only depend on the public reaction to, to decide how to do these, about these things. And I, I guess I should say, uh, partially answering your earlier question, it is essential that we move to an understanding of corruption which does transcend the, prid quo, the quid pro quo and try to understand the broader picture of how a system can corrupt people, even if they're good people. I don't actually believe that people, individuals, occasionally will have rotten eggs, but usually the people, I think, go in with good motives, but they enter in a system that ends up warping their original good motives. And I think we need that broader conception of, uh, of what corruption is if we are to improve politics in the United States. So one last question for me, and then if sure. uh, folks want to go to the microphone, this would be a good time to do it. Um, you ran against uh, an incumbent governor who ha who's ambitious and shrewd. Uh, he mobilized the Democratic Party's um, sort of loyal constituencies, machines, uh, to make sure that, that, uh, that you and, and your running mate uh, didn't break out. Um, you told me when we were talking about this before that, that you were surprised to encounter the depth of some of this political kind of professional machinery in the party in places like Long Island and the Bronx. Um, but how... Uh, tough did the opposite, did the opposition play? I mean, did you get phone calls in the middle of the night? Did you, <laughs> no. uh, anybody come up and mysteriously hit you in the knees with a blood <laughs> pipe or, uh, what, what was the experience of, especially toward the end, you in particular got some momentum. Um, it seemed conceivable that you could even win. Did that change the atmosphere in some way? Um, so, that, that thing, that's a journalist, uh, I, I, for, for good questions. I think they tried to feed the media uh, 
uh, in fact, I know what they do. What they did is try to, to, in terms of the sort of dirtier stuff, is to try to feed the media uh, unflattering ideas, ideas for stories, uh, things that are really one of the problems. Actually, another reason people don't go into politics, I think, who are uh, good, interesting people, is that um, you know the standards for politics are uh, are almost like uh, the standards are like you know from the 50s or something where. Um, uh, I think Zephyr, even minor things they chase around, Zephyr had like bought a car in Vermont to use in Vermont, but she technically should have, you know, uh, registered the plate in New York because she's in New York, so they tried to make a big deal out of that as mm -hmm. tax evasion or something, you know. So the standard's so high that almost everyone in this room would probably, you know, if investigated by a political reporter. But what they did do is opposite research, try and push things out, you know, pictures of, even just like bad looking pictures of me where I look strange or weird or, you know, camping or, you know, in some strange outfit, they, they put that out to the press and try to get that uh, played. So that was some of the things. I, yeah. uh, one of my uh, advisees at the, at the school this uh -huh. uh, year did opposition research before going to journalism school, so uh -huh. that's a conversion to virtue, <laughs> I guess, of some sort. But yeah. I noticed today that the, one of the candidates running in the Kansas uh, Senate race, which is unexpectedly contested, was uh, caught because He's a farmer, and on his website, the corn he was showing was actually a stock photo from Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't take you down. Uh, yeah. I know. had one thing. It was, this is hilarious. So in copyright class sometimes, I don donned this ridiculous outfit, a giant blue bear suit, which I then, you know, you have to do things that get your students' attention these days. I think some <laughs> of my students here maybe have seen it. Somehow that was leaked to the press by... Why did you <laughs> don a giant blue suddenly bear suit? What, well, what it's to the demonstrate the non-copyrightability of costumes and the copyrightability of masks, as I can get my students to attest to. Actually, it's just one of those things. I, I realized it was like the perfect uh, prop. Uh -huh. uh, and so that was like somehow the, uh, the pre they tried to get the press interested. That was one of the good examples. Great. We've yeah. got about uh, 15 minutes left. We'll take some questions from the, the audience. Question. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Wu. Um, I have some questions. Um, Maybe one just one time? question per, per questioner, okay, so choose um, your best one. My most important question, how do you inspire people to be more involved in politics? How can you get people, what, is, what do you think is the solution to get more people involved in the politics to vote, to get yes. to the polls? What do you think is your solution to that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's sort of a perennial uh, question. As I said, I think the pattern is that people are either completely obsessed with politics, spend all their time on it, or, or none. You know, and we, we don't have a lot of people in the middle. And I think, I guess, I'd go back to the virtue. I don't think it's only the duty to make, you know, politics interesting and dance around. I, I think it's uh, that one should have a sense of, of duty. It's very important, I think, to inculcate a certain sense of, of duty to do a certain level of participation. One that's consistent with, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be everything. Everyone has to vote in every tiny little thing. But I, I, I wouldn't only rely and we have this way in, in, the, in the United States of saying that you know everything has to be exciting or exhilarating I mean voting isn't always that exciting and if you try and say well it's going to be the best experience of your life it's going to be pretty disappointing the second time and third time you know what I mean I mean we sometimes try to oversell it a little bit and people said I voted and it, it didn't feel that great <laughs> so <laughs> I think instead of trying to like you know make it all about carrots and you know uh, handing out prizes door prizes you should sort of try to uh, inculcate a, from the beginning a sense of duty and I think we have had that at points in our country mm -hmm. where one votes out of duty not out of uh, titillation or I excitement. I think that's true in some yeah. other democracies that I've passed through as well. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, th thank you uh, Professor Wu for your sure. appearance here and also Dean Cole. I mean you had a very busy day up in Yale mm -hmm. uh, on the Snowden uh, surveillance and we appreciate you know that uh, you're coming down so quickly. Um, my question is uh, I think it's commendable that you ran for lieutenant governor because very few professors combine their professorate, you know, with a progressive activism, and that's so, so very badly needed in society. Uh, Como was on the ropes, you know, from the Moreland Commission as you brought up. So I was sort of wondering why you didn't use corruption as your major issue. Why didn't uh, you use what? Sorry. Why didn't you use corruption as as your major issue in the campaign? Well, we sort of thought we did. <laughs> Maybe it got uh, interpreted uh, differently. But I, we had thought that our main... No, I mean, teacher off did, but I mean, I don't think you did. No. 
Well, maybe we would take turns talking about things. Uh, but no, I, I did think of it as one of our, the major reasons uh, to get involved. I mean, I believe uh, we, we were talking. I guess I, feel, I felt we would handle. T actually, if you want to uh, know the uh, the answer, at one point, uh, Zephyr Teachout and I sat down and I and we said, you know, we sort of need to divide the uh, agenda in two. And she was more of the the negative, and I was more of the opportunity agenda, and she was more of the corruption agenda. So we sort of, because if you have the same person say the same thing over and over, uh, but we both kind of believed and shared an interest. This one of the major issues facing. Uh, facing uh, the country. Also, she is uh, also an expert on corruption, like a real, uh, more of an expert than I am. And I um, thought I was more of an expert just, on she economic. Just wrote a book about just it, right? Right. published a book about it, so right. she um, actually was somebody's better qualified. While well, I was better qualified, to talk right. about economic opportunity and, and uh, net neutrality and Comcast mergers, things like that. Thank that you makes for sense. Your question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to bring up the um, the private prison industry as an example of a sphere in which private the, which industry, sorry, private prison industry, private um, prison. Oh, industry. private prison. Yes, yeah, a good as example. An example yeah. of a sphere in which um, private interests are being put over public ones and contributing to serious political corruption um, in the form of like politicians who are essentially bought who, and like lobby for harsher sentencing and anti-immigration legislation. And I think that that leads to an interesting question that involves Columbia as an institution that's invested in the private prison industry. Um, how can we think about our own supposed like devotion to free speech and justice when at the same time we're investing in private prisons? Um, yeah. No, it's, it's a good issue to raise. I, I do agree that the private uh, prison uh, industry and anything, uh, it, it follows a very classic pattern. I'm not an expert on that particular area, but there is a very classic pattern where we, we privatize something which perhaps ought to be public and therefore very strongly develops its own agenda and becomes uh, hard to, to get rid of. And then in particular wants to expand, 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 because that's naturally what corporations want to do. They're for-profit entities, so they want to expand, expand, even if it might be in the public interest for them to shrink. And it's clearly in the public interest for us to have less people in prison, not more people in prison. I think it's one of the most serious problems in our country. I should point out that New York, I've noticed this on the campaign trail, spends more money than any other state on, on prisons. Um, uh, Rikers Island, is the number is just astonishing. It's $168,000 a year to keep someone in Rikers Island. That was a public facility. And then, of course, $168,000. So it makes Columbia tuition seem like this incredibly good deal for once, which is, <laughs> frankly, a rare thing. Um, you know, and you could just, and m many of these are nonviolent prisoners who, you know, arrested for, for marijuana possession or something like that, and there they are. Uh, it, we spent 100 So uh, it, it is a classic example of we have let too much uh, become, and you need leaders who are willing to stand up for it. The really interesting thing your question is you say, well, the politicians are bought. But how exactly does that happen? And, I mean, it isn't that politicians are bought in the traditional way that someone hands them you know, a big bag of money. Okay, sometimes that happens, but more often it's just they get the sense that, well, maybe it's better to be on this side of the issue, otherwise I might lose these donations. And, my, and that's the kind of more subtle stuff, the sort of invisible pressures. Because it's not true that they're bought in an explicit, they don't sign a contract, you know, I'm on your side, where's my money? It's yeah. subtle, and that's what we really need to investigate and deal with. I think that there are also tangible ways that they're bought through things like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, um, which like also comes back to Columbia because ALEC has kind of like collaborated with the Corrections Corporation of America and G4S, which are two companies that Columbia is invested in. Um, so I do think that we can talk about ways that politicians are actually bought in ways that um, we are like tangibly invested in those politicians being bought and in those like increasing sentences, anti-immigrant le legislations, like we are very much, very complicit in that, um, which is why I wanted to ask maybe a little bit more about how Columbia as an institution, how its kind of rhetoric is like corrupted by this investment. Right. So thank you. There's some folks behind you, and I yeah. uh, just want to make sure everyone thank has you. a chance to ask their question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, hi, Professor Wu. Thanks again for coming out and speaking with us. I was wondering, uh, you talked briefly about the 
potential solutions to this whole money and politics and corruption. Yes. Although you are a little bit pessimistic, which I am too. Um, and I was wondering if you're, you've been following uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig's uh, Mayday Pack and the idea of kind of using money to get money out of politics. Yes. And I was wondering if you could speak to that or give your sure. opinion on that. So Larry actually, Larry was one of my mentors and um, he, I shouldn't have been so pessimistic because uh, that's part of the problem. What Larry points out is that our own sense that nothing can be done is itself a really destructive thing. And in fact, things uh, can be done. New York City, for example, has public financing. I think public financing, which means that every dollar you raise, you get six more dollars, really changes the kind of people who will run for office and the people who think about running for office. Um, it, if you, I mean, even if I was campaigning, if we had gotten six more dollars for every dollar we raised, we would have had several million dollars in which we could have uh, bought TV ads and therefore fought uh, a more or less even battle. Um, but we weren't in that position. So I think just pushing for very common sense things like public financing of much more of the election system can make a huge difference. And I didn't mean, I'm sorry if I was uh, pessimistic. I really believe that, I, maybe uh, let me give my message of uplift. I think it <laughs> is time, and I mean it, for people, ordinary people, regular people, good people to get into politics at all levels. There is an opportunity now uh, there's a lot going on at state and local levels. And I am not a fatalistic person. I don't think these things can be beaten. I think America goes through perpetual cycles where things get too bad and then there's renewal. And the period I'm thinking about most importantly is the progressive area 100 years ago where people started saying, you know, this is just too much. The country is too unequal, it's too unfair. And there was a, a, a progressive party, Woodrow Wilson, some real massive change in this country. And so we go through these cycles and now is a time where things have gone too far and where it's time to change. Public finance is a great example. Uh, Larry's idea of using money uh, to, in other words, <laughs> uh, fu is an ingenious and great idea and I support it and I hope it, it works. It's essentially he's going to raise a lot of money yeah. in order to try. So what he does is he gives money to policy. people. He's, he has what's called a super PAC. So he has a large amounts of money but he only supports candidates who are in favor of campaign finance reform. <laughs> so in other words, it's a fundraising device to try to get rid of, of fundraising. So there's something very, or, or not fundraising altogether, but get rid of money in politics. Embrace the irony, I guess. Embrace the irony is right, Thank uh, you very much. We're putting it, sure. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I think you touched on two really great points, um, primaries and the way they attract extreme partisan politics and yeah. then, um, also, obviously, campaign donations. And it's interesting with the FEC's um, vote earlier this month on top flight donors being able to, to donate to conventions. Um, but as you know, many of us journalists may be interested in covering politics, um, at what point does our level of scrutiny perhaps get in the way of yeah. people in wanting to enter um, campaigns? I know you touched on that as somebody who has run for office. So I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. No, I, I agree with it. I, when you look at the grand picture of things that discourage or encourage people to, to run for office, I think the culture of, uh, of, of political reporters, I think so many people I know who would be great people would be like, oh yeah, but you know, I just don't want to expose my family or myself to someone trying to come through and find everything possibly embarrassing about it and report on it. And I think that uh, the political reporters has contributed uh, to, to that culture where it's only, you know, particular, it's only the kind of people who feel particularly willing to allow, uh, you know, everything about themselves and their family be, be known or sort of portrayed in a negative light. And I think it's a serious problem and I think the press and journalists do pay, bear some of the burden for discouraging ordinary people to, to run for office. Now, I'm saying obviously the press should be free, you know, if people are money laundering or have a past, but it's more the, the investigations just of things that they find kind of normatively weird, like, oh, maybe this person was divorced during their life, or maybe they, you know, had, uh, you know, maybe struggled with some kind of, what's that? You know, people struggle with some kind of issue in their past and it becomes the subject of obsessive reporting. The other challenge, this was something I found interesting campaigning, um, is how much damage 
one sentence can potentially do to your campaign. <laughs> and you know, the fact, and maybe there's something unavoidable yeah. about it, well, but. but it, and it isn't, yeah. it's sort of structural, both of those things to some right. extent, because of the, the uh, speed and velocity that uh, comments can, can spread, but also on the, the way that the fragmentation of the media and the emergence of partisan channels has blended with opposition yeah. research. And, and the, true. and the amount of information that's out there to be had I, in another era would have taken many more months to get to your blue bear suit, I'm sure. But they right. probably posted <laughs> the videos. And, um, so, one thing I noticed is that uh, this was weird: is that the press, the voters often didn't really seem to care about these things, so it didn't really hurt you. But it was uh, the candidate, of course, cares, and then the press seems to care too. Right and a tiny group of people. But actually, the voters really don't care that much about these issues. Right. But the problem is it can be very discouraging or, or first of all, make people not want to run at all because they're, you know, they think it's going to be, maybe they, um, I'm just trying to think of something that's embarrassing but not that embarrassing earlier in their life, like, you know, they had some disease or something earlier in their yeah. life. And they're really embarrassed about it, but the voters really don't care. Yeah, and sometimes yeah, there's a disconnect. Like, sometimes journalists are more excited about it themselves than they are than what it really uh, matters to the, journal the so voters. We'll take the last question, sure. but as, as we, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I meant to ask you earlier, you mentioned you, that you would have been better off if you'd been able to buy more television. Yeah. But there is this uh, idea that's come up recently that an unexpected consequence of Citizens United has been that voters tune out political advertising because it's oversaturated. So yeah, right. is it your judgment that it was effective? I think it was effective. Um, the reason is that the scarcest resource and the most important thing to have is name recognition at all. And then in the world where most people don't have, pay you know, any attention to this at all, name recognition has become incredibly valuable, which is partially why political dynasties, again, you know, we were supposed to have this revolution. Now you don't pass on like the baronship or whatever, but you pass on a political name, Clinton or, or Cuomo or, or um, Bush. You pass on the name and therefore you ought to, it's almost like a billion dollars of fundraising or something, like the amount to replicate. Maybe it's unreplicatable. So I think that's really important. Let me say my, my quote about, uh, it was really, dealing with political reporters was really interesting on the campaign trail because I was used to other kind of reporters. And the political reporters looked very similar, but I noticed after a while that they had a poisonous sting. That is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they had a poisonous stinger. They looked like the other species, but they could get you. And uh, so I, after a while, I learned not to be as chatty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. last, last question. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I've got more of a fundamental question. Sure. Um, you said that it's actually not about the institutions, it's about the people in the end. Yes. Um, but then, again, you also said, uh, well, a lot of the people who do go into politics come with good motives and yeah. um, ideals, but then they get warped as soon as they get, as yes. they get into the system. So isn't it then very much a problem, a, syst yeah, a systemic problem, a systematic problem, and um, yeah, down, comes down to the institutions? Yes, well, I, th that, that, is a, yeah, that, is, that is a good point. I, I, it's overstating it to say that institutions don't matter at all and the structure of the institutions uh, don't matter at all because, of course, I think uh, they do. I just think sometimes there's a tendency, particularly um, left, uh, the conservatives and, 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 and liberals, to, to focus exclusively on getting the right institutions as if it's the solution to everything, when in fact the virtue of the people involved in the system will be important. But I agree with exactly the point you made, is that ultimately, even if you do have uh, attract good public-spirited people, if the institutional culture or structure warps them um, or, or, or corrupts them, then I think that's bad. I think we need to remember, we talk about corruption a lot, I guess I'll end on this note, to note that the logical opposite of corruption is virtue, and I think we need to go back to seeking political public virtue in our leaders, and in fact in our leaders, not only in government, but in every sector of the American system. But, but don't you need then structures that enable people to have these virtues? Yeah, I guess I'm saying you, you uh, need both, which is actually what the framers also thought. I mean, they set up the checks and balances and so forth. But our mistake is to only think, and I think sometimes we are too much focused on just trying to get the perfect system. Thank you very much. Thank you all.
Uh, there is a, a table with someone from our admission shop in the back, if any of you are uh, prospective students. And I believe there is a reception in the world room. Yes. Thank you. Okay.